welcome to Wealth Matters, where we discuss the opportunities and challenges of preserving and managing wealth. We are broadcasting today via remote access, so that in light of the COVID-19 health emergency, we can maintain our social distancing and still bring you today's show. Please be patient if we experience any technical glitches. We hope that everyone listening is safe and healthy and doing what they can to protect themselves and our communities during this health emergency. Wealth Matters is presented to you by Gatsowitz Frankel, a law firm dedicated to resolving disputes involving your wealth, whether your will, your trust, your business, or your investments. For news, pictures, and tips, go to our website at gatsowitzfrankel.com or follow us on Twitter at Estate Dispute. Our show's hashtag is Wealth Matters. Your hosts today are Craig Frankel and welcoming for the first time in Wealth Matters, my partner, Leanne Gilbert. Today, we're talking about financial planning in today's unpredictable world. Thanks, Craig. Um, and it's time to introduce our guests today. We're pleased to have Christopher Shukri, a financial advisor with Alex Br Brown, a division of Raymond James, and Joseph Salito, who's an attorney with Paige Scranton Sprouse, Tucker, and Ford PC. Um, we always start by having our guests tell us a little bit about themselves and their practice. So, Chris, if you would start. Thanks, Leanne, uh, and thanks, Craig. Um, so, I'm with Alex Brown, which is a division of Raymond James. And you know we provide financial advice to individuals, families, institutions, and uh, it's really comprehensive financial advice uh, when, in which we're quarterbacking basically you know, everything personally, financially for uh, individuals and families. Um, my background is I'm actually a, uh, a graduate of Georgia Tech. I graduated with a degree in electrical engineer. Uh, was an electrical engineer for a few years and then went to business school and then graduated from business school uh, from the University of Georgia and uh, got into wealth management. And I was with uh, Genspring Family Offices before, uh, uh, initially, and then uh, Goldman Sachs after that and now currently with Alex Brown. How about you, Joseph? Uh, my name is Joseph Salito and uh, the law firm that I'm with is known as Paige Scranum. It's been in Columbus for over 100 years. It's a full service law firm, and I've been with the firm since I got out of law school in 2001, graduated from Georgia State. Um, my practice is trust and estates work, probate, guardianship, uh, things of that sort. Uh, before, gradu uh, before graduating from Georgia State, I went to Vanderbilt, and uh, my wife's a lawyer, I've got two children and happy to be on the radio show today. Thanks for coming, guys. Let's start off really and jump in easily. So, Chris, why don't you tell us, I love your phrase quarterbacking. Tell me what, what is a financial plan? What's a financial plan? Well, uh, think of it as, it's a document that uh, it captures, it does three things, right? So the first thing is that it provides a snapshot of your of your current state of affairs. So what you currently have financially, so that could, that's assets and liabilities, cash flows. Um, and then the second thing it does is it provides, uh, it kind of articulates and formalizes several financial objectives or goals. Um, and then you know, the, the last thing it does is that it, uh, implement strategies to achieve each individual financial objective or goals. So, you know, it's, it's really just a, you know, it's a, it's a blueprint basically uh, to help folks understand where they're at, where they want to go, and then ultimately how to get there. How is a financial plan different than an estate plan, Joseph? Well, the, the financial plan is such a huge help in doing an estate plan because you find that so many people don't really know or haven't thought about in a while maybe exactly how something's titled. Maybe they know more about what it's worth, but the financial plan helps with the numbers and helps generate some tax advice. But it first and foremost, lets people take stock of what they have, how is it owned, does it have any sort of beneficiary designation uh, or, or, or 
any TOD or pay on death type thing that would really come into play when we do the estate plan because the estate plan is a way to uh, manage those assets during life, but mostly how are those assets going to be transferred at death. But knowing how they're titled, knowing what they're worth, is, a, is having that financial plan is a big piece of having an estate plan that's actually worth something. Um, so many people come to me and say, I just need a simple will, or I want it to go in a trust for my spouse. But without knowing more about what are the assets and how do they move on their own, um, you might give a will or prepare a will that really doesn't do much of anything because all of the assets are owned in a joint account or the, ma the majority assets already have a beneficiary designation to someone else even, or maybe even to the spouse, which is fine. So they, they go together very well. They do uh, two different things, but they're, they're very helpful. Uh, I would say, oh, I'm sorry. I would say that the, you know, there's, there's differences. There's also similarities, right? The, the uh, purpose of having a financial plan is ultimately to create clarity, right? Clarity around you know, what you have, you know, where you're going and how you're going to get there. And, you know, the, the difference might be in just the timing. So the financial plan is really more about, you know, your monetary objectives during your lifetime and when you're fully cognitive and you know the the estate plan is something that actually is it's not mutually exclusive from the financial plan in fact it's very there's a ton of overlap um, but ultimately what that does is it creates clarity around what happens you know should you become incapacitated or upon your death um, so i think both of them the the purpose of them is ultimately to create clarity right and i think that's that's what i tell clients always is you know, whether it's an estate plan, a financial plan, or, you know, your New Year's resolution to, you know, be healthy or lose weight. I mean, you, you want, number one, you know, the goal is to create clarity around what, where you're at, what you want to get to. And I think the more specific you make those objectives and those goals, uh, you know, the easier it is to you know, reverse engineer how to get there. And also, the more likely it is that you know you maintain discipline to achieve those goals. Well, as your life changes, I imagine you need to review your estate plan, and as the economy changes, you would review your financial plan. Is that accurate? Yes, sure. You know, some people say every seven years. I've heard every five years. Um, certainly, anytime there's an event, whether it's a birth or a death or a marriage or something, you know, bigs happen in the economy. There's a lot of good reasons to look at it. Um, but putting it on a calendar, you know, every five years seems to make sense. But it's really hard to go, uh, uh, it's really hard to get a, get a plan that's going to last you your life. And uh, so many people, I end up telling them, don't let, you know, what's the phrase, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, if we can just have some plan, you're going to be uh, just a quantum leap ahead of where you're at. So maybe we get closer to perfection five years from now, but uh, just just do something and then make it better later. Right, Chris? Yeah, I would agree. I think that uh, for the most part, a financial plan should be uh, pretty stable. Uh, and there are certain events such as uh, birth, death, um, marriage, or maybe even the anticipation of marriage uh, or divorce, or I guess the anticipation of divorce, uh, that may alter the financial plan. Um, but it, you know, they're all long-term goals. And so you have to have a long-term focus and not let the noise of, you know, a, a bad economy or bad, you know, equity mark, stock markets alter your course. Um, but it's helpful to have that financial plan there. So that way you understand, okay, well, you understand the levers that you can you know, pull in different situations. So you basically have a caring for you know, curveballs that life will throw. 
Joseph, you mentioned something that I, I think is important, and Leanne and I see it all the time when we get to disputes. You said one of the things you always want to check is how things are titled or why they have beneficiary designations. Chris, when you're looking at a financial plan, do, do most people actually understand how things are owned or titled or designations, or is this a problem you're seeing as, as, as an initial step? Uh, no, I don't think many people understand it. Um, well, I, I think people understand it, but they don't, they, they may not, you know, execute it. So I think that, you know, the titling of accounts and it really needs to align with, you know, what your trust in the state plan is basically you know, conveying. So you just want to make sure that whatever your intent is, whoever your intended recipient is uh, of the accounts, contingent, primary and contingent, that it actually is going to go to them. Uh, Joseph, answer that. So, so you, you mentioned that a will obviously transfers property at death, but it's only the property you own. But when we talk about designations, and you mentioned a TOD, you know, transfer on death, but there's also joint accounts people can write checks on. How does it fall in when you're looking at an estate plan? How much really is actually being controlled by the will and how much is kind of being controlled by other factors? Yeah. Uh, it depends. Sometimes uh, a vast majority of the estate could be controlled by other factors. And sometimes that's fine, but often it's not. And, um, you know, the, the probate estate is what you own that is controlled by your will. And then the non-probate estate is what you own that's controlled by some other means, whether it's a beneficiary designation or joint ownership with right of survivorship, they call it, meaning the last person standing gets it. The last one alive owns it. Um, so, you know, typical spouses, there's a lot of joint ownership and beneficiary designations, and, and that's fine. Um, where, where it ends up being a problem, or can be a problem, is, uh, is when there's one spouse alive and the children, and there's children. And so maybe one child gets named as a joint account owner uh, for whatever reason, and uh, it was probably out of convenience or check writing capabilities. And then at the end of the day, uh, what was always understood to be a kind of a friendly, help me write checks type arrangement turns into, well, mom put me on this account, so surely mom wanted me to have it at death. You know, and the banks don't get involved. The, bank, the banks just do what the documents say, or the life insurance company doesn't care what the will says, if, if one person's name is beneficiary, then that's gonna control. So what, what a lot of people do is they don't rely on the powers of attorney. And that's what I try to tell them. Is if you want your daughter to help you write checks and look out for your financial things, do a power of attorney and trust that. You don't have to put your, your children on accounts with you, despite what the bank may say, despite what makes it easier maybe for the bank, the, the pow a power of attorney is what is needed and what should be relied upon to do those things. Um, and let's highlight that. If you go to a bank and say, I'd like to help my mom write a check, they're going to put you in a joint account with writer survivorship. That means that you can use the account for anything while your mom is alive and then you get it at death. But you could actually ask a bank, it's called a power of attorney account, a POA account that only lets you sign under authority. And I want to highlight something that we're seeing. This also applies to caregivers. It's not just family members. And uh, our, our Chris mentioned dissipation of, of marriage. Dissipation happens in lots of ways, not just divorce, sometimes death, but sometimes estrangement or separation for whatever reasons. And so you're going to have often blended families, different people with different relationships. So it really is important to understand who's controlling what. Chris, let me ask you a question. What, what types of things you talked about having clarity as to what you own, mm -hmm. what types of things are in a financial plan? Is it just where you've invested your money, like in a brokerage account? Is it businesses? I mean, what, what, what are the elements of a financial plan? You know, the, uh, the more detail, the better. So, uh, you know, it's often here's what I own currently. And that can be checking account, investment accounts, 
four hundred one ks, IRAs, Roth IRAs, um, you know, and also five twenty nine plans, uh, UTMAs. Um, it could be. It also includes you know your personal residence, any investment properties that you may have, but it also includes your W two income, right? So your you know your earned income. All of that is. You know, they go, they, they're basically inputs into the financial plan. Um, and when I said the more detail, the better, it's because you know, the more detail that you provide, the more information you provide, um, the more specific you provide uh, the, the information that's provided, the greater clarity you have in you know, ultimately reverse engineering how you get to your objectives. And when you talk about objectives, are we talking about um, tax planning? Are we talking about retirement planning? You know, with it, it's retirement planning for sure. I think that's probably one of the biggest, uh, you know, the biggest uses of financial plans. Um, and basically what it is, you know, you, you say, look, I, you know, you make an assumption that you're going to live until you're 95. And you're going to retire at 65 or you want to retire at 65. So how much money will you need, you know, to retire at 65 um, in order to keep you, you know, through to 95, right? And maybe at 95, you also still want to have some assets that you can bequeath to your, uh, that you can, you know, uh, give to your, your children or whoever. Um, and so what you're doing ultimately is saying, okay, well, how do I get, to that number at 65, while right now I'm at 40. Um, and so, you know, tax planning is certainly a part of it, uh, but retirement planning is, I mean, that's, that's usually the, the main purpose of the financial plan, uh, but it also could be college planning. So in 18 years, I'm gonna need this much money to put my uh, kids through college or this kid through college assuming they don't get a scholarship and you know you, there's a lot of assumptions obviously there's, so there's a lot of noise but you know they have 18 years to get there how do i get to that number starting today um and so that's what a financial plan incorporates and so that's why there can be several objectives it can be retirement planning it could be tax pay it could be a uh, college planning um it can be philanthropic planning um and so it's it, it all is part of it tax planning is you know is what is used to help determine how you're ultimately going to get to those numbers. Joseph, how do tax planning and philanthropic planning play into estate planning? Oh yeah. Those, uh, you know, the estate tax, you know, people think about, well, I don't really have an estate or I don't have enough money to worry about the death tax or estate tax. And so, Therefore, I don't need an estate plan. But um, you know, there's there are a lot of taxes to be uh, concerned. There's plenty of taxes to be concerned about, even if you're not necessarily worried about the estate tax. So, income tax issues and uh, charitable deductions, which are which affect the income tax, or whether you're just uh, charitably inclined, regardless of the tax uh, ramifications or benefits. Both uh, charitable planning and income tax planning would be part of something that you might just refer to as an estate plan. Um, because um, when you want to make a gift or you want to create a trust or a will, that all just comes under the idea of an estate plan, but it may have different tax objectives. It may not have any tax objectives at all, but it's certainly the case that the income tax is going to affect everyone while the estate tax affects very, very few. Um, another big point that people ask me a lot is, you know, what about when I receive an inheritance? Do I have to show that on my income tax return? And, you know, generally speaking, what you inherit is not taxable to you. Now, the earnings it makes or the interest, the dividend, something like that. Now, or the income, the last income of the deceased may flow to you, but by and large, what you receive is not, not income. So that's, uh, that's a common tax question a lot of people ask. The other one they ask is, well, what is my tax basis in my inherited assets? Like if you inherit some Coca-Cola stock, 
that your mom bought back when it was $20 a share. Um, the good news is, at least under current tax law, you take what's called an adjusted basis or a step up in basis. So if you inherit something at death, through death, you take a basis equal to the date of death value. Whereas if you take an asset from mom through a gift, she gives you her basis, which could be a very low basis. So when you turn around and sell that Coke stock, you may, you may realize a lot of gain where if you could be patient, let's say, and wait, you, uh, you, you get that basis. Now, Congress is always talking about maybe changing these basis rules, but those are the two big tax things as far as the state that, that people come, come across. Thanks. Um, I just want to take a second and remind our listeners that you are listening to Wealth Matters, the radio show where we discuss the opportunities and challenges of preserving and managing wealth. We are your hosts, Leanne Gilbert and Craig Frankel from the fiduciary litigation law firm of Gaslowitz Frankel. And we are talking with Christopher Schurke, financial advisor with Alex Brown, a divis division of Raymond James, and Joseph Salito, an attorney with Page, Scranton, Sprouse, Tucker, and Ford PC. And our topic today is financial planning in today's unpredictable world. Joseph, Craig? I wanted to follow up on what you just said about um, tax planning. Where, where you deal with income tax focus. I know that a lot of people don't, don't, don't follow that. Should, should, should you in your estate plan and in your financial plan be revisiting this from time to time, the tax focus on what is my tax basis? When am I gonna be taxed? Should I change things? Can I change things even if it's a trust? How often should you look at that? Gosh. How can you look at that, I guess is a better question. Yeah, often it's as often as Congress seems to want to tinker with it. So it's right now and in the past 10 years, it's been very, uh, it's been a hot topic. Um, and so, you know, politically, the state tax is uh, of interest. Now, it's not a big revenue raiser for the federal government, but it is kind of a political issue in that people feel like uh, the wealthy should pay their share. So um, with with the estate tax uh, affecting fewer and fewer people, which means the estate tax exemption is getting higher and higher, um, it does cause you to focus more on income tax issues. Before, we may have put things in trust to hide them from estate tax, to hide them from future estate tax. Hide is such a strong word. I love that word, hide it. We're hiding it. We don't, we, you know, the federal government has enough money, but, but now, or, or, or as the estate tax changes, instead of uh, hiding, we're, we possibly would expose assets to the next estate or to estate tax, because in exposing assets to estate tax that we know we won't pay because the exemptions are so high, we are actually getting a benefit on the income tax side. Um, so trust for example, that were designed um, to keep assets for the benefit, let's say, of a surviving spouse, but then not let them be a part of the surviving spouse's estate. We're, we're, we're changing those trusts as we draft them going forward, or we're putting some contingent language in them to say, gosh, if we don't need to worry about, in effect, if we don't need to worry about the estate tax, let's go ahead and subject these assets to the estate tax so that we can get that step up in basis that we need. I want to remind our listeners that although we're, we're broadcasting from Georgia and Georgia does not have a state uh, imposed estate tax, other states do. And so sometimes we've got to look at that. And, and that, that really brings me to the next question for you, Chris. Are you finding that, that cl clients uh, who have some wealth, that they own assets in different States and, and how does that affect a financial plan? You know, it uh, it doesn't really affect the financial plan. So yeah, the, most of the, my clients have assets in different states. It really affects it if um, they spend 183 days a year in Florida or Texas, right? I mean, that that's ultimately where now they're saying, okay, well, I live in Florida, but you know, maybe they're external, their uh, assets outside of their state is actually in Georgia, right? So their, their site is in Florida. 
the Florida residents. Um, but it, it really shouldn't affect a financial plan um, because ultimately you're just trying, you know, the financial plan is, is focused on monetary targets. Um, so it, it really doesn't affect the financial plan. It certainly affects the, you know, the state plan. Um, and the tax planning is really more about where your, you know, where your declared state of residence is. Joseph, yeah. do you yeah. find that people who move to Georgia or away from Georgia, they may have been in a community property state, now they're in a different type of state if they're remarried. Do you, if somebody moves to Georgia and they've already got a state planning, whether it be a trust or a will, does that change when you move to Georgia? Do you need to revisit it? Or is it something that pretty much can go anywhere in the country? Well, I think it's, it's worth taking a look at, but you'll probably be fine. You know, uh, I don't believe there's a state in the country, for example, that has a different witnessing requirement than, than two witnesses to make a will. So I think you've got a will, or let's say you've got a living trust and you've come, you've come to Georgia, uh, you'll probably be fine. It does not hurt to have that looked over. But w one thing I will say about folks that come here or folks that have property in other states, those that come here want a living trust or those that look uh, out and Google things and try to get up to speed on wealth matters, they, uh, they will come to me saying, I need a living trust. I need a revocable trust. I, don't need, I need to avoid probate. But, but it's very true that in Georgia, the, the probate process uh, is not uh, difficult. It's not something to be avoided. It's not something that the costs of which are dictated by the assets in your name. So now Florida residents, you know, yes, uh, the, the, the probate system there is to be avoided. And so, uh, but and most of what you see on the internet uh, talks about that because um, maybe Georgia is an outlier, but it is true that um, that probate avoidance is not something uh, that kind of runs the show here in Georgia. That's not to say living trusts don't have a use, because if someone is a Georgia resident but has property in other states, for example, Florida, or uh, really any other state, you can really simplify the probate process by at least having those assets that are in other states owned by a trust. Um, so that you can avoid that state's probate process. And there's a lot of other reasons to have a living trust, but, but when, when someone has property in other states, that's kind of a clear signal that you, you may benefit from not only a will, but also a trust. What, what is a living trust? Well, living trust is just a, maybe another name for revocable trust. It's a trust that, uh, that uh, handles your assets manages your assets, holds your assets while you're alive. So I guess that's where the living part comes. But it can also serve to, as a will substitute in a way, it can also serve to uh, govern the distribution of your assets at death. Uh, so you could just have a living trust and not have a will. The issue with that is you need to be sure that all of your assets have been transferred to this living trust while you're alive, because other, otherwise, uh, they won't. They won't be able to be handled at death. But it's a great management tool. For example, if you, if you don't have anyone you trust to be your power of attorney and help you with financial things, but you have a good relationship with a bank or some corporate trustee, uh, transferring assets to a living trust and naming that corporate trustee as trustee would allow you to have someone that you trust to help you while you're alive with your financial affairs, check writing management of assets, whatever it might be. And that might be very helpful as, as you watch and as you age, that someone has experience with your financials as you get older and then can take over. But you, you, you highlighted something, someone you trust. Chris, do you find that your clients are easily find somebody who could serve as a fiduciary, someone who could be that agent for a power of attorney? Or is this a difficult issue for your clients? Yeah, for the most part, they, uh, yeah, I think they don't have a problem finding someone that they trust or that can serve as a fiduciary. If they, um, yeah, of course, you could have a you know, corporate trustee, for instance, um, 
And there's benefits of that, right? Because someone that you trust today may not be someone that you trust you know, later, um, or they might not also be around later. So, uh, but in general, our clients don't have uh, any difficulty finding someone that they trust. When your client finds somebody that they want to be their fiduciary, Chris, do you then sit down with that person and explain your client's financial plan to them, or do you wait until they're needed to step in? Yeah, it, it really depends on you know, how, how much uh, leeway the client provides, right? So confidentiality is pretty maniacal about that. Uh, but in general, the more uh, information that they have, you know, the better that they can prepare. Or at a minimum, if they at least know, okay, well, I'm, I'm to reach out to Chris and he's the person with you know, all the information, then it just makes it that much easier. So let's follow up on that. So you were very diplomatic and so was Leanne when she asked the question. How many people of your clients actually let you talk either to the fiduciary or you mentioned earlier the family or are people more like traditional like my parents um, who never talked about money? So how many people are willing to talk about it to either the other financial planners or, or advisors and their own family? I, I, I really push that. Um, and that's because uh, the sooner the the children know, right? Especially the children, the sooner they know, uh, I think the the better, right? It shouldn't be a taboo subject. Um, instead, they should understand you know, the use of you know the not only obviously what amount there is, but really more importantly is you know what's the point of having money and you know, all of the risks and you know, sacrifices and discipline that was needed to accumulate this wealth. Um, and so therefore you, you know, attach some level of meaning to it. Um, and then maybe even your expectations of how the children would, you know, use this wealth, right? Um, and that even shouldn't be a taboo subject, at least you can have a negative screen of saying, I don't want you using this money for this, 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 I'd rather you use this money for you know, this, this, this. And you can, you know, put some language around that in a, uh, you know, you can put that in a trust, right, with HEMS clauses, healthcare, education, you know, maintenance and support. Um, but ultimately, the, the sooner they have that understanding of, you know, all, everything from you know, what your expectations are to how it was accumulated and all of the hard work and risks and discipline uh, that was needed to get there, you know, the, the sooner they have an appreciation for the money. So essentially, Chris, you're being diplomatic too. So that's the goal. Joseph, yeah. how successful are you at getting your clients to actually do it? Tell their children, here's what we're doing. Yeah. No, I don't, you don't see that a lot. Um, at least I don't. The high net worth folks, too, of course, that's a real struggle. Uh, so very wealthy folks, that, that's a real struggle for them to try to decide when and how much should a child know. Of course, there's books upon books written about that. And, um, but your, your original, your, or part of your original question was how, how willing are clients to maybe talk with a broader team or talk with their future fiduciaries or, or let them know. I, I see a lot of that, no matter the, well, you know, please talk to my CPA, please talk to my financial planner, you know, um, talk to my banker. Let's get all on the same page. I want to be sure. And then some folks like to talk early to their uh, future power of attorney uh, or their future executor. And then uh, some people ascribe to the idea of, well, if I ask them if they want to serve, they might tell me no. And if I didn't ask them and just name them, when the time comes, they'll just do it, you know, out of <laughs> out of a need. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and name them. So you do get some of that camp. Um, I know that doesn't maybe directly answer your question, but I always find that interesting that uh, there's there's two camps. Some people like to give permission, and some people just ask for forgiveness because it is it can be somewhat of a thankless job to be an executor or a trustee, even if you are paid some compensation. It's, uh, it's a lot of drama and stress and uh, back and forth. 
uh, you're the gatekeeper. Um, and then power of attorney is, uh, can be difficult on its own as well. It can be a very long-term job. Um, but no one has to be an expert. There's always people to help, accountants and brokers and financial uh, advisors. And so that's good. Anyone who's in a role like that or anyone who's struggling to figure out who should be named in that role, keep in mind that the person does not need to be some jack of all trades. Uh, they, they will get help from a lot of people. You, first and foremost, it must be someone you can trust. And if you don't have that trust, then that's why there are corporate folks or professionals that are in the business. And I, I find more and more that that's being, that's, that's being more and more necessary. Just, uh, maybe it's because people are living, are living longer and they need assistance longer. And so the job takes a long time or people are realizing the power of trust and the usefulness of trust, whether tax planning or otherwise. And so it's a long-term job that's maybe better left to someone who's uh, trying to do that for a living. I think we need to underscore the change. I think that the demographics of aging, where our parents are living a lot longer and therefore, and, and our health system, where we're spending a lot more money, changes things. And as our children also move around the country and aren't with us, that the financial needs of our parents, not only do they change, oftentimes there's less or different wealth. And, and so, so Chris, are you seeing families come when they're nearing retirement age and saying, you know, 60 or whatever and saying, you know, maybe I should change what I am doing? Are you seeing people coming to you then or are you finding people coming to you hopefully earlier? Um, earlier, but that might be just uh, a product of you know, the, the client base. So most of my clients are private company business owners who um, you know, are, yeah, are thinking of an exit or maybe there's already kind of an immediate exit in the, uh, in the near future. Um, so, you know, and it generally happens before they're in their 60s. I mean, my client base tends to be, you know, not much younger than 60, but, uh, you know, in the 50s. So I, I think that, uh, you know, I don't think that they should, you know, I don't know if it warrants a change. If you, if you get older, you decide, well, I need to change what I'm doing unless what you're doing is just ineffective. Um, and, you know, you, you want something better. So, yeah, yeah it's... Tough, it's a tough answer, uh, question to answer because I, I just feel like most of my clients are you know, folks that are private company business owners. There's an impetus for them to reach out to me and change their plan. And a lot of times it's just because there's going to be significant wealth created from you know, a, uh, an exit. You talk about an exit. And, and Joseph, you and, and, and Chris can answer this. Are your clients coming to you in advance to say, how do I transition this business to the next generation? or to a sale, or are you finding that they come to you, unfortunately, afterwards, um, when something's already happened and you aren't able to plan it? How, how is that playing out in the real world? Uh, I think some of each, but I think folks like Chris, they probably get more front-end talk than the lawyers. Um, it just depends on the relationship. I, don't, I, I personally don't have a lot of uh, clients like that that are business owners that are coming up with a sale or something, but, but it is true. It, it's a shame whether, whatever the event, um, I, I, I feel like for the most part, people are coming in at the end, but uh, I would bet Chris would say he's got, he's got good clients that think, let's talk about this before it happens. Well, they, they just have a good advisor that tells them that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, uh, no, you shouldn't so, kid that having an advisor along the way is really important. It is, and I think that um, you know, it's if there are clients of mine already, then uh, you know that that's going to happen for sure. I mean, I, I always tell folks that own private businesses or just a business, uh, there's always an exit, whether it's you know to wind it down or to sell it or to you know transfer it to the next generation. Um, yeah, I guess the only other option is to go bankrupt, but or to you know <laughs> to, to go under. But um, so if they're running their business, that you know that should be a plan that they have in place 
from the onset. Um, and it doesn't have to be implemented immediately, but there's got to be some, you know, plan in place where, you know, it's, it's very clear. Okay, if I get to a point where I decide I want to engage with an investment banker because I want to sell my company, or if I get an unsolicited offer to purchase my company, and there's a lot of important uh, reasons why you want to have, you know, a you want to have you want to be engaged with your estate attorney right before there's a letter of intent on your on your company. Okay, so we're we're getting towards the end of the show. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot. And Joseph, we're going to start with you. You have a potential client. What's the advice that you would give, the one advice to your potential client? What do they need to do most? Uh, they need to think about, do they have those kind of four documents? Or you might even get away with three documents that almost everybody needs. Uh, I would say, which is a will or some sort of trust or will, a power of attorney for financial things and a healthcare power of attorney or advanced directive or living will, you might have it referred to. So those three documents is kind of the basic first step. To, and that can really uh, serve you for a long time. Whether you become incapacitated or whether you pass away, you've got something in writing that that handles those situations. So that, that, that's, the, that's the first and foremost for most people that, that I talk to. Okay, Chris, you get the chance. Advice in advance to your client. If you could tell them anything before they came to you, what would it be? It would actually be uh, you know, to talk to uh, folks like uh, Joe. Um, so, uh, because I really do think that having those documents in place, right, the, the way advanced medical directives, general power of attorney is probably the most important first step. Uh, but the, the, you know, the advice I would give them in addition to that is you really need to have a team that you have a lot of confidence in. And that team should be comprised of you know, your, your financial advisor, your legal advisor, your you know, trust and estate attorney, your uh, tax advisor, your accountant, and they all should be your insurance uh, you know, advisor. So they all should be working together, right? There should, there's likely one that ends up quarterbacking the relationship with the client, but that is your, your team. And in addition to that, and this is something that I, uh, I harp on a lot as well, which is you need to consolidate information, right? So, you know, we have, uh, you know, what is effectively a digital Dropbox in our client web. And I tell clients, upload your trust and estate plans, all of your, all of your legal documents, even you know, tell clients if they have LLCs for specific real estate investments, upload your operating agreement, your, um, you know, your EIN numbers. But the financial plan will also capture most of, almost everything should, uh, of what you own. But you know, having that all in one place, having all that information in one place, should God forbid the worst happen, will give you, it, it, it's just a huge, you know, burden off your shoulders because you then know, well, if something happens to either me or both me and my spouse, then for sure there's one place that at least most, if not all of the information can be accessed. All the it's the bottom things. left drawer of my office. You didn't know that? <laughs> no, it's... <laughs> All right, well, Always good to have a backup. Before we wrap up today, um, Chris and Joseph, if you would just let us know how our listeners can get in touch with you if they want to find out more about you and your firm, um, starting with Joseph. Well, you can call me directly, 706-243-5631, and uh, I'll be there to answer it. And... Uh, you can call me as well, 404-442-6766, or you can go to alexbrown.com and find your way to uh, the Atlanta office and look for Christopher Shukri under team. Yeah. I want to thank everyone today for listening to Wealth Matters, where we discuss the opportunities and challenges of preserving and managing wealth. For more information about Gasowitz Frankel and our 
guests today and our other shows, please go to our website at gaslitwithfrankel.com and remember to follow us on Twitter at Estate Dispute and use our show's hashtag, Wealth Matters. Our guests today were Christopher Shukri, a financial advisor with Alex Brown, and Joseph Salito, an attorney with Paige Scranton in uh, Columbus, Georgia. Please join us every fourth Wednesday of the month at 8.30 a.m. here at Wealth Matters on Business Radio X. <laughs>